be in First John chapter 1, 6. We'll close up in uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So, um, um, in writing this, John is writing to um, this uh, group of believers. He calls them little children in chapter 2, verse 1, uh, as a caring apostle or pastor or father if role if you would have it but uh, uh, the the main emphasis here is uh, having fellowship with the father and with the son it is obvious that the assumption is they're having fellowship with the holy spirit and fellow believers but uh, his emphasis is on how do we maintain how do we walk in such a way that uh, we maintain fellowship with the Father and the Son, uh, knowing that, as he will write to us, that uh, we uh, have a particular battle with sin, um, and, uh, you know, we can't deny it. If we deny it, then we're, we're calling God a liar and saying we've never sinned. That's not the truth. Uh, to say that we don't walk at times in sin and have sin revealed in our lives is also would be a lie, and it would separate us from fellowship and everybody here. And uh, uh, if you've been in church for any length of time, and uh, I'll just point at other people, You've met other people that, you know, they've been walking in sin during the week and, you know, they, they say, hi, brother, or hi, sister, and, you know, and then later you find out, oh, man, they were struggling their brains out, you know, or they were having certain issues. Well, guess what? You know, we all deal with those issues. We, you know, get our game day face on and we come and, you know, we, we, we do what we do, even though at times I, I may know that, uh, you know, I got an issue between God and myself. Um, and uh, so does that automatically take us out of, okay, I'm not saved or I'm the bigger hypocrite than anybody else? No, it's, uh, it's not like that. It is... Uh, um, it is our plight, this side of heaven, before we get there. And that is, sin is present. You know, the depravity of man is, is true. It's real. And yes, I've been born again, but uh, he hasn't completely eradicated my sin nature. It, it creeps up, and uh, it shows its ugly little face to me quite often. And so we're going to deal with some issues Paul is, or, or uh, John is, I mean, about this issue and, and the remedy in many cases um, for this issue and how I maintain a close walk with the Lord, you know, because that's the whole desire. Perfection is never to be had. Um, uh, it, it's not. If you if you approach Christianity like one day you're you're just going to be holier than thou, and then God will be happy with you. Perish the thought. Um, God loves us right where we're at, and he'll he he works with us as we are. And yeah, sometimes I, I'm not quite measuring up to even what I know. Uh, but uh, Jesus is always measured up. And I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, but his goal is that we have a, a, a walk in the light and a walk in communion and fellowship with the Lord. Okay, and that's, that's his goal of writing this. So um, in chapter 1, verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him 
and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, um, th this, this book requires uh, a little bit of Greek language. I mean, that's the uh, first time I read this book uh, was the first night I got saved. And I read through the whole New Testament, and this is at the end, and I went, oh my gosh, I'm already not saved. <laughs> <laughs> I've already blown it here, and uh, obviously I, I didn't understand the Holy Spirit didn't leave me dangling there, uh, you know, but uh, I, I realized that this book needed some further study for me to be able to understand it. So he says, if we have fellowship with him, that's communion, that's our word for communion, it means to have all things in common. Um, and walk in darkness. Darkness is used ten times in this book. Um, and darkness is where you're walking as a shady character. You know, we've used that term, we've heard that term, shady deal, shady character. Well, that's what that is. It's a person that's walk, walking in the shadows. It's a person walking in sin. Um, and it's used ten times by John in this book, and I won't go through all the references for it because uh, we'll get there sooner or later. But he says, if, if we're, we're claiming to have fellowship over here and over here we're walking, what, contrary, in the dark, shady dealing, you know, then something's wrong. I'm either being a hypocrite about my fellowship with God, which is typically the case, um, and he says, we lie about ourselves, and we do not practice the truth. The word for walk here is the way that we live and conduct our lives. That's the way it's used quite often in the New Testament. It's our conduct. It's how we conduct ourselves on a regular basis. Um, and so, um, and we'll, we'll get more into that part of the conduct and how we maintain uh, a close walk with the Lord. Um, but then he goes on and he says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So the remedy is to walk in the light. You say, well, you know what, I got shadows that pop up in my life, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, I come under this shady deal, you know, and uh, uh, how do I deal with that? Um, he says, we have fellowship with one another. If we walk in light, we maintain fellowship with God. Um, one another could be used two different ways. Uh, allos is the word. It says maintaining fellowship with f fellow believers, birds of a feather flock together, you know, but it, uh, other commentators say this is uh, maintaining a walk with the Lord himself. Um, I prefer the, the former one that I stay in fellowship. You know, that's, that's one of the first indicators of somebody walking in the shadows is they don't get into fellowship. They begin to separate from fellowship because they're, it's darkness. It's not necessarily that I'm looking around sin sniffing or you are. That's not the point. The point is they're convicted. And conviction is good, as we will see. And, but the further away from the light I get, the, the more convicted I can be. Um, uh, and he says, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So, um, conviction is an ever-present companion for a believer. Conviction of sin. It is. Uh, it's it's just part of our lives. We need to just get used to it. Um, a church or churches that teach the word of God 
will be clean churches. Why? Because when you come into church, you hear the truth, and the truth cleans me. It convicts me. Sometimes I go, oh my, that's what's going on in my life. It's not that we all stand up and confess, oh, I tell you, I did, you know. That's not the issue. It's just the Holy Spirit convicts us and we go, yeah, right, Lord. As we will see, it's, it's just an agreement with the Lord. Um, um, and he, he uh, in, in John chapter 15, verses 2 through 4, when Jesus is talking to his disciples, he says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, to get the proper interpretation of this, that's Judas Iscariot. Okay, that's Judas Iscariot. He's taken away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And so that's ouch. You know, there's times when I'm doing okay, and then all of a sudden God's doing some, uh, you know, work in my life, and it doesn't feel real good, but that's so I can bear more fruit, not the other way around. And he, he says this to the 11. You, oh, well, he says it to all of them, but the 11 are the ones that get it. You are already clean because of the words which I have spoken to you. How were they cleaned? By the word of God, right? He didn't hold any punches with these guys. He was gracious with them, but he, he called them out on the things, you know, certain things that went on in their lives. But they were hearing the word of God. They were convicted, you know, and uh, he said, that's what keeps them clean. That's why I tell you, the church that teaches the word of God is a clean church. Because you hear the word of God, and God does his little, you know, gets his little clippers out and clips away, and, <laughs> and you might feel it for a moment or part of the time in a church service, but by the time you walk out, you're clean. You're clean because the Holy Spirit has done the work through the word of God that I walk out rejoicing because that's the way that this works. It's also the way your devotions work. Devotion is not, and I don't know, you know, I don't want to shoot anybody down, but devotions are not where I go and get a kind word. Devotions where I sit before the Lord and let him speak to me. Um, you know, my devotions are not, at, at times, are... I'll read a passage and I'll get a good commentary that I don't use on Sunday morning and I'll read what that person says in the comments. And quite often God really, you know, does a, a, a rooted issue in my life. He, he does some clipping, but I never regret it. I never walk away and go, oh man, I wish I'd have never read the Bible. No. It's just the way to get me clean, keep me clean, to get me started on the right foot in fellowship with God, allowing him to do his work. Snip, snip. But once he does the snip, snip, it's over. You walk out the door and you go out rejoicing because you're, you're in close fellowship with the Lord. Um, verse 8. But if we say we... Have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. This is the issue. He already deals with the issue in the previous verse. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We're never going to get away from that. I'm never going to get away from the cross. I'm never going to get away from my Savior and say, Oh, I, I got this now. I'm holy. I'm righteous. I'm on my own. I don't need your help anymore. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. As a matter of fact, quite often, God will use certain things in our lives to draw us near. But not to condemn us. But because he wants us near, he'll do certain things in my life. And, uh, but it's never for a lack of love. 
It's not like that. I'm not on a law like that. I'm not. I can walk shady, and we'll, we'll deal with that issue a little further down the road. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And people can be self-deceived and say, well, that's not really sin, or I'm not really that bad. And, you know, if you ever share your faith, you always, you've heard that one a hundred times. And uh, nobody likes to be confronted or convicted. I prefer to do it at home in the privacy of my office between me, my Bible, <laughs> my commentary, and my conscience. I'd rather do it there than have it come out where somebody else has to point it out to me because my first reaction is going to be denial. You know that river in Egypt? Denial. Yes. I have a big river in my life. Yes, it's called denial. Um, and he says, and the truth is not is. Doesn't abide. Doesn't abide. That means I'm also not walking in fellowship. That's uh, the, 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 the point of it. He goes on in verse 9, if we confess our sins... And the word for confess here is agree with God. In other words, the Holy Spirit comes, convicts me, use the word of God, or just convicts me. And I go, ah, oh, yeah. And I agree with God and say, yeah, what you see is what you see, and I agree with you. What you see is not good. Uh, I ask for your forgiveness. That's the way this works. So if I get further and further and further away from the Lord, further and further and further away from his word, what happens? The Bible declares that sin, when it is conceived, brings forth death. It brings forth death. Death to what? My relationship with God. I don't want to die to my relationship with God. He's the source of my life. If I didn't have the hope of Jesus Christ... It'd be rough to go out of the door day by day and week by week. But I know he's there, you know. Um, so he says, if we confess, if we agree to our sins as they are revealed to us, don't, don't be searching for sin yourself. Don't be going, well, I'm going to be the holy person. I'm going to deal with this, and I'm going to be. That's like doing a Galatians thing, putting yourself under the law, saying, God, I will measure up. Maybe nobody else will, but I'll measure up. That's like being a Peter. They're all going to run away, but I ain't going to run away. Did he run away? Yeah, he ran away. In fact, he had a special prayer for him because it was, it was frightening what was coming his way. Um. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a bar of soap, man. A, it, 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 what God does is he does heart surgery. And he restores my heart to the right place where it needs to be. I don't have to beat myself up. Although at times I do because I'm so grieved by my sin. Well, when I confessed it, agreed with God, he cleansed it. He washed it. Sometimes I have to play catch up because of my human nature, my emotions, you know, and that's okay. Um, but he is faithful. That's where our, we get our word for faith. I mean, he's faithful. Um, he's full of faith towards us when it comes to being faithful to forgive us, right? And um, to forgive us all our sins, our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to wash us, to clean us. This would be like King David saying, create a new heart within me. That's exactly what God does. 
when I come to him in agreement, and he does what? He gives me a new heart because he cleanses me of all the old stuff. He's not, he's not holding it over my head. Well, you've done that for so many times. You're just, you know, um, that's not how he does that. Let me ask you something. If you get close to somebody, there's a couple of married couples in there. If you get close to somebody, or maybe you've been married, or maybe you live with somebody, or maybe you just have some close associates, how long does it take before you see flaws within them? Oh, of course, you have all the perfect friends. <laughs> you have all those perfect people around you that never flaw. They are, they are the epitome of what's those little Christian dolls? Uh, um, huh? Precious moments. Yes, you have all. You all have precious moment. You know, friends. Uh, I'm sorry I don't, and I ain't no precious moment friend myself. You get close enough to me, you're going to see stretch marks and, and, and a few other items, and you'll go, how can God use that guy? Because I've done it to other pastors. How can God use that guy? Well, guess what? Because God maintains, those people maintain a close walk. It's not a matter of whether I sin or you sin or anybody else sins. It's what do you do with it? Do you live in it? Do you, you know, enjoy it? Or are you just walking in it saying, well, I'll sin the grace may abound? Um, I had the privilege of knowing a, quite an older gentleman of the the word and uh, I got to hang out at his house a few times we spent some time together and I wasn't certainly wasn't looking for sin in this man's life um, but I saw it I saw that he opined about other preachers and he had an opinion about other churches and other things but I also noticed something. He'd blurt that stuff out, but he wouldn't keep running down the road. He'd get convicted, and he'd just shut up, and he'd move on. Because he learned how to be sensitive to the Spirit and realize, ah, I don't need to be here. Didn't make a big issue out of it. He just changed course, started walking with the Lord. I, I watched it multiple times. And it was refreshing, because this is a man that walked with the Lord from 20 to 80, so he had a walk for at least 60 years. Highly successful, well-known, but he wasn't banking on any of that stuff. He had a close walk with the Spirit of God, and uh, he wasn't in denial <laughs> that great river, he wasn't in denial over that. He just moved on. He accepted and he just moved on. And I watched it multiple times and it just, it was just something I learned. I learned. It was like, no, nah, I don't have to, you know, beat myself up. I just got to catch up with the Holy Spirit at that point. You know, I just got to get back walking with him. You know, no long drawn out, you know, because that's what God wants. He wants to have fellowship. He wants me to walk with him in fellowship. He realizes there's, you know, uh, fellowship interruptus that happens in our lives. But hopefully it happens less and less and less and we recover from it very quickly. That's the whole goal. You know, that makes life a joy. Because, you know, then I'm not under the law. Uh, you know. Um, Proverbs 10, 12. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. 
I believe Peter was a, a Proverbs reader uh, because in Proverbs 17, 9, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friends. Well, is God in the business of separating us? No. It says per 1 Peter 4, 8, and this is where I believe Peter is just a man of the book of Proverbs. He who covers a transgression or above all things have fervent love for one another for love co will cover a multitude of sins. I'm not supposed to be looking for sin in people's lives. I'm for looking for excuses to love on people because that's what God does with me. I mean, if you just read your Bible and see all the characters that God chose, do you see anybody perfect in there? Come on. It's got to be one in there, doesn't there? Oh, Noah did really good until he got drunk. <laughs> David was a great king until... Samson was a, well, not so good guy, but he recovered, you know. I mean, who are we going to find? Doesn't have a stretch mark, uh, you know, a flaw, a character issue that, that God dealt with and covered and, you know, worked with them through that process of transformation. Abraham. I mean, George Washington, basically, of, of Israel. I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. <laughs> Bet he did more than that. Um, Abraham, you know, had his flaws. No, she's, she's not my wife. She's my sister. Twice! Twice! Did God just say, oh, Abraham, i got to go find somebody new, man. You're just not cutting the mustard. No, God covered his sins and delivered him and his wife, fortunately for his wife. I'd be questioning the character of my husband at that point, but uh, whatever. Um, so... Let me give you a, a picture of grace, if you would allow me here. Because um, this is who we are. It's a perfect picture. Exodus 3, 1 and 2. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert. Where's the back of the desert? I'd like to know. I've seen a lot of desert in California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah. Where's the backside? <laughs> I don't know, but whatever it is, he went to the backside. Uh, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared To him in the flame of fire from the midst of a bush. A bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Who's in the middle of the bush? Jesus. Angel of the Lord. Uh, we don't know exactly what kind of bush this is. Some speculate. Whatever it is, it's probably dry. It's a desert. Probably not lush and green and got leaves all over it, you know, in a garden someplace. You don't find those in the desert, folks. You find dried out bushes. Sometimes it's tumbleweeds going down the road, you know. The road runner's chasing it. <laughs> so, the Lord comes down in his glory 
The bush is burning, but it's not consumed. No crackle of, you know, the, the fire. You know, you guys remember that crackle of sitting by a campfire and the wood crackling. No crackle. No sparks popping, you know, where the wood splits and the little sparks fly here and there. None of that stuff. We're the bush, folks. We're the bush. And different commentators put different twists on this, but uh, I'm going to say we're the bush. The people of God are the bush. Because you have a holy God who dwells within you, why are you not consumed? You still sin. Why hasn't he consumed you? Why hasn't he just burned you up and you became a crackling, popping, you know? Why not? It's called grace. It's called grace. That's what it is. There's no other way to put it. The bush represents the nation of Israel. And if it was a matter of trial, then it would be consumed, be feeling the burn. I don't believe that's the case. That's us. That's where we're at. That's the grace of God. So if you wonder whether God's going to stay with you or he's going to burn you up and fry you and toast you and, you know, he's not. So, sin is an issue in our lives. It's got to be dealt with. It does. There's no doubt it's got to be dealt with on a regular basis. Um, why does it have to be dealt with? Some may ask. Well, if I'm under grace and I'm not going to be consumed, why do I, you know, need to deal with sin why do I even have to worry about it I'm already saved oh you're saved but sin will destroy your life habitual practicing of sin will destroy your life bad poor choices will destroy your life they will Paul put it this way in 2 Timothy 2 20 through 22 but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he's not saying you're, uh, you can be a, a vessel for dishonor and cleanse yourself. He's saying if you get away from the dishonorable vessels, then you'll be set apart. In other words, you can't, you can't hang out with dishonorable vessels and be set apart to God. You're either set apart to God or you're set apart to something different. He will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, set apart, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So, If uh, you came to my house, uh, most of you have been there, some of you have been there. You know, my wife has a china cabinet that she got from her mom in China. It's a, you know, and, you know, special china. We don't just take it out and, you know, use it very often, although it did, does get used a little bit. And this is a great house, and I don't live in a great house. I live in a nice house, and I live there. But in a great house, and you would have places for honor for what? Gold vessels and silver vessels and things like that. You would want to show them off. You would want to be on a, a, a shelf or in a, uh, what is it? curio cabinet or whatever the case may be, you would want them to be set apart. 
Now, are you going to go get your Drano and go stick it in there with them? You know, you're not. You're not going to go get your bleach and your ammonia and make mustard gas, <laughs> you know, kill everybody. No, that's another cabinet, isn't it? That's a cabinet that everybody has to visit, but it's not one unless you're weird, you know, that people really want to look through and go, oh, I wonder what kind of cleaning stuff they got here or whatever, you know. We try to hide all that stuff, you know, in one sense, or somebody does. But uh, so what kind of a vessel do we want to be? And sin is an issue here. It really is. It's like, do I want to live in the world, connected to the world, dishonorable to God? Or do I want to be honorable and set apart for God so that I'm useful, so that I'm sanctified, so that he's proud of me, that he can put me up on his shelf and show me off? We all can make a choice. Um, if you go back a couple of books, you go to Hebrews chapter 3. And this is a, the best example I can give you of what sin will do. Ignoring the Holy Spirit, blowing through his conviction... Um, Hebrews 3, verse 6, and we'll see if we get to day, probably get to 19, but uh, he writes to us, But Christ has son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, and this comes from Psalm, 19, Psalm 95, it's a quote, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion. In the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty years, therefore I was angry with that generation, and said they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my way, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. You guys all know this story. Children of Israel came up to the promised land and didn't want to go in. They sinned against God and sin finally hardened their hearts. And God says, have your heart hard. I'll wait. I'll wait. Beware, brethren, verse 12, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. That's what sin does. It hardens my heart towards God, towards sin, makes me insensitive, and will destroy me, just like these people, if I allow it to run run roughshod over me. But we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled, indeed was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now, with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And I realize this is a warning but it is a valid warning about what sin will do to a person. These people saw the miracles of God. They went through the Red Sea. They were at Mount uh, Horeb. They heard the voice of God. They saw the fire on top of the mountain. 
I mean, they saw the water come out of rock. They ate the manna. There were so many different things that God did, and these people kept hardening their hearts and complaining against God, murmuring. And they eventually destroyed them because they would never enter into a place of trusting God. To enter into the rest and the promised land that God had prepared for them. And so God says, I'm going to wait for your kids. Your kids will follow me. And it's a, it's a sad, tragic deal. And he, the, the writer here, writing Hebrews, we don't know who it is. <laughs> He's writing to the Jews, and this is just before AD 70. The pressure is on, and many of these people want to go back to Judaism and deny Jesus Christ. And he says, don't do it. Don't do it. This is what will happen to you. Don't do it. another story so if you go back over to first John we'll hit chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 and close up here we'll see if we can get some calories so he writes to them my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. That's what he writes. And if anyone sins, and I love this, it's highlighted in my Bible, we, he didn't say you, I'm perfect, we, have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. What's an advocate? It's called comforter in different chapters. It's, some of it just totally leaves people not really understanding what Jesus' uh, role is here. Uh, he's a defense attorney who takes up the case of his client before a court. That's what he does. I've told you before, if you've been there, he's the best defense lawyer in all the world. Not only is a defense lawyer, he's also a what? Prosecuting lawyer. We'll find that out too. But he's not prosecuting us. So we have the best defense lawyer. He says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The righteous. And he himself is the propitiation. This word for propitiation is uh, has to do with atonement, has to do with a, a sacrifice that atones for someone who is guilty. Uh, technically speaking, this is the Ark of the Covenant, and it's speaking of when the, the, the high priest went in there and offered the blood on the Ark of the Covenant to cover the sins of Israel for a year. Well, Jesus didn't go to that Ark of the Covenant. He went to heaven, and he offered his blood at what? The real throne of God, and that's what he's saying, is he's already done this. He's already atoned for us, and so he says he's the atonement for our sins not only for ours, but also for the whole world. Boy, there's a mouthful. That means he died for everybody's sins. Everybody that you can consider. Not everyone will respond because it demands a response. So it's not universal salvation, but it is offered to all. It is absolutely offered to all. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and this will be the, we hope, the closer. Zechariah is a prophet, along with Haggai, at the time of uh, the children of Israel had fallen down. 
They had started rebuilding the temple. It's 20 years later. They had failed miserably. They had stopped, ceased, desisted, and decided that they were going to build their own houses and just live their lives and leave the work of God for somebody else. Uh, they were not going to do the work. They were so discouraged, and, you know, there's just so much that went on there. So in verse 3, it says, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not the brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, the angel did, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity, your sins, from you and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you walk in my ways, and if you keep my commandments, then you shall also judge my house goes on and talks about I will give you um, you know rulership over my courts why did God do this why did he cleanse him why did he defend him why did he do any of this stuff because he was chosen he was God's guy now, he admonished him, which is warning, right? He said, don't, don't go backwards, buddy. We're, we're starting a new beginning here, fresh and new. Move forward. Move forward. And giving him new garments and all that stuff was total restoration to the work of the ministry. It's called intercession. That's what it is. It's intercession. It's having an advocate, a defense lawyer. Where did Satan go? He had to leave. He had to leave. He's not greater than God. He had to leave. In Luke uh, 22, 31 and 32, Peter boasting about, hey, I'm, you know, these guys are going to deny you. And Jesus said, Peter, Satan has come to the very throne of God, no different than this. And he has asked for you <laughs> by name, personally. Do you think Satan knows your name? Yeah, I think he knows your name. And he attacks you all the time. that he may sift your soul, leave you ruined and wasted. And Jesus said, but I have prayed for you. I have interceded. I've become, what, the advocate, the counselor. And so we see in this, in both cases, where he's a defense lawyer, and he's also a what? Prosecuting attorney. He prosecutes, what, Satan. Beat it, buddy. Right? And uh, how can he do that? Because in each case, he was looking forward to what he was going to do with the cross. And that was defeat the enemy. So, Don't you worry, never fear. Robin Hood will soon be here. He robs from the rich and gives to the... No, not Robin Hood. Jesus will soon be here to defend you. Do you know that there's another advocate? That's the Holy Spirit spoken of four times. Same way. 
So you have a defense lawyer that dwells within you. You have a defense lawyer that sits at the right hand of the Father to plead your case. Both of them are pleading our case. They're pleading the blood of Christ. So how am I going to walk in the light, stay in the light? I'm going to maintain a close walk. I'm going to let God's word do its work in my heart. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit convict me, and then I'm going to go, you, I agree with you. I ask for your forgiveness. It's washed away. I keep going. I don't let him hamstring me and <laughs> wallow on the ground. We don't do that. If God be for us, who can be against us? If he didn't spare his son, what's the greatest treasure that God had? His son. He didn't spare his son because he loved us so much. Will he, you know, say, well, my son died for you, but forget it. I'm not giving you nothing else. Don't bother coming to the door till you're perfect. That's not it. And sometimes he just overwhelms us and you need to just let him overwhelm you with grace. Just let him put the wind in your sail so you can move down the road. Because he's for you. He's not against you. He made a choice for you. He said, I choose you for my A-team. I choose you for my A-team. So, thanks, Lord, for your word. I pray that you bless these, your people, all of us. Lord, may we lift up our eyes towards heaven <laughs> and see the radiant counsel of your smile towards us. Your graciousness, may we feel it, may we know it. May you bless us every day with a close walk, a joy, a peace, no matter what the world throws at us. So bless us now in Jesus' name, amen. No, ice cream may not be the top thing, but we won't kick you out. Maybe